God, who by the riches of your grace regarding the eternal importance of faith to the world and who revealed your purposes from your holy word of life. The righteous shall live by faith. Gratefully, we, your sons and daughters, come now to worship you through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Reformation Sunday. 503 years ago in Germany, one man took a bold stand for the gospel of faith, and the church has never been the same. Martin Luther was that man, and faith in Christ has been proclaimed freely ever since. And today, in our worship, our songs reflect that theme, faith in Christ. And it is our prayer that all who view this service will come to a saving faith in Jesus Christ. Welcome to another pre-recorded service of Open Door Believers Chapel. Special greetings to all our friends around the world. And please do not forget our Zoom Worldwide Family Fellowship at 7 p.m. Wednesday evening with the elders. And as you pray, remember your assembly responsibility before the Lord, the office is on Central American Boulevard. Today's item is done for us by the spoken word, administered by cousins Celestina Zul and Randy Cleland. 
is written by our brother from Guyana, a student presently at the University of the West Indies in Trinidad, Lemar Williams. Establish the work of our hands upon us. Yes, establish the work of our hands upon us. As that portion of scripture speaks, I pray that we understand what is in our hands so that God in turn will favor and establish it. I pray that he uses it for his glory. In Jesus' mighty name I pray. Question. What is in our hands? It goes like this. What is in our hands? Tick tock, as time is ticking like the hands on a clock. I ask you, what is in your hands? Is it dripping and is it dropping like the, hand, like the sand through the hourglass? Or are we sitting by as our opportunity pass? What is in our hands? Yes, I'm here to raise more issues. I am not here to offer any excuse, but I'm here to talk to those good hands and even those that were abused. Yes, abused. Abused by those meant to protect your gifts, those meant to protect your potential and your purpose. They trick you out of your innocence, while others trick you like the circus. Even in my pond and clowning, I can see beneath your beautiful smile that in your tears, you are drowning, but have no fear. I am here, help is here. I am here to call out those molesters, telling them to leave our Davids, our Roots, and our Esthers. I am here to spoil your schemes before you spoil to dream. Telling them to be silent, I am here to tell them to scream. scream. Yes, I am here to tell them that they can talk to our leaders. They can talk to our elders and they can even call the police. I am a man of practical needs and I am here to offer relief through Christ who strengthens me. So let's restore belief. One, One two, three, let's go. So start the process of recovery. You can be using both. You start your own show. You don't have to be the fastest. You can take it slow. It doesn't matter if your hands are poor or they were broken. I want to remind you that you were already called chosen. Yes, you were called a prophet by Jesus Christ the Messiah. So lift your chin a little bit higher. On your label, there is no expiry because greater is he that is within us than he that is in the world. What is in your hands? You see, as time is ticking by, it's getting late, you see. But I am here to tell you, with God, it is never too late. So don't give in to society's pressures and self-heat. Don't give in to those things. So rise up, leaders. Rise up, elders. Because in your hands, there are gifts that the world needs. Treasures to appreciate. So, what is in your hands? Can I suggest that in your hands, there is only success, that in your hands there is greatness. It doesn't matter where you were born because you were born blessed. So, can I tell you to seek Him first, the kingdom of God and all His righteousness because the rest is history. Trust the process. God will establish and favor what is in your hands. Don't let anyone talk you all the way. You can achieve greatness, shalom, and blessings. Oh
today, which is a very important aspect of our service, is taken from Galatians chapter 3, verses 10 to 14, and it will be read to us by our brother, Nathan Scott. Those who depend on obeying the law live under a curse, for the scripture says, whoever does not always obey everything that is written in the book of the law is under God's curse. No, it is clear that no one is put right with God by means of the law, because the scripture says, only the person who is put right with God through faith shall live. But the law has nothing to do with faith. Instead, as the scripture says, whoever does everything the law require will live. But by becoming a curse for us, Christ has redeemed us from the curse that the law brings. For the scripture says, anyone who is hanged on a tree is under God's curse. Christ did this in order that the blessing which God promised to Abraham might be given to the Gentiles by means of Christ Jesus, so that through faith we might receive the spirit promised by God. This is the word of of the Lord.
reflection. Faith is a living power from heaven which grabs the promise
again our speaker is our brother and elder at Open Door Believers Chapel. Finishing his talks on the gospel, Brother Dwayne Scott. It's time for Wretched Radio with Todd Friel. Shocked. I am absolutely shocked. And oh, so disappointed. (sighs) This is Wretched Radio. So many people agog. They're simply agog. They can't believe the conclusions of a man who decided, because apparently he's got a lot of COVID free time, to listen to 18 hours of sermons from nine of America's biggest churches. And the people are reading his summary of those sermons And they are acting like this is a blast of new information. If you have been listening to almost any sermon from virtually any super mega high profile preacher, not all of them, but many of them, and forget the mega church part from so many evangelicals these days, you will notice something is missing. And that something would be the gospel the very basics the very essence of the christian faith it can be alluded to it's referenced you hear it vaguely off in the distance but rarely in most not all evangelical churches you will only hear a whisper bits pieces of the gospel and that has been going on for decades and so when i read this article from nine marks.org hence the nine churches they chose i wasn't shocked this came out last week i actually buried it <laughs> it's something that we've talked about here so many times i hope but when i started reading the responses of people i went oh wow there are so many people who are not aware of this absolute trend that is probably the biggest and worst trend in the church we aren't preaching the gospel is it any wonder you hear what you hear on witness wednesdays here on wretched when we go to the campuses hey are you a christian yeah cool tell me the gospel huh and it happens over and over again and there's no wonder and here is why so many of these preachers get a pass because you know the gospel And you perhaps sit in a church and you hear them reference something. And you think, well, there it is. There's the gospel right there. And I would say, oh, no, it isn't. It isn't the whole gospel. It isn't the gospel explained in a contextual way that allows the hearer to go, I get it. I understand that thing. Instead, they'll hear things. Maybe the pastor will have enough courage to use the S word, sins. And you know, our sins are forgiven and you go well there's the gospel well it's a line about the gospel but we're talking about presenting it in a way where the individual who is not regenerated can go look i get it already i understand god's character and nature i understand that i deserve his wrath i understand jesus took it for me i understand he rose from the dead i understand that i need to repent and put my trust in jesus christ the individual in a church who is not regenerated should either get annoyed by hearing the gospel or skedaddle last week i shared with you the gospel message i did my best to put it in a way that persons could understand from the video that you just saw, you see that many times this gospel message is not widely understood, nor is it widely proclaimed, which is a problem because this is one of the main, one of our main responsibilities as Christians to proclaim the good news that we ourselves heard and understood and believed. Today is the last in our series on the gospel and this morning I want to look at the question that I asked the very first time um, in in part one of this series. How can the gospel resolve the social issues of our time? You'll remember that in the first part of the series I showed a clip of a basketball player who said that he, he didn't who did not kneel during the anthem and when asked if he believed 
that black lives matter. He said, yes, he believed that black lives matter, but he believed that the gospel was the answer to the social problems that we face. You may be wondering, how does the good news of Jesus Christ resolve the racial issues or other human and social injustices of our time? It is my hope that as we look at the nature of the gospel this morning, you will then understand the power the gospel has to resolve these problems. One of my absolutely favorite Bob Marley songs is War. You, I just love how the song starts. You know, dum, 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 dum. Well, well, you guys know how it starts, right? Bob Marley says, until the philosophy that whole one race superior and another inferior is finally and permanently discredited and abandoned everywhere is war. Until there is no longer first class and second class citizens of any nation. Until the color of a man's skin is of no more significance than the color of his eyes is war. Until the basic human rights are equally guaranteed to all without regards to race. We will have war. Bob Marley's song describes a state, the state of conflict or hostility that often exists in the world today between different peoples or different groups of people. Just recently, I saw a Facebook video of the, some PUP supporters and UDP supporters in conflict. A man all back out a, a gun and fire shot two times. War. Well, not war, war, but conflict. And these are Belizeans, people who born and grow up in this country in conflict with each other over politics. The same is the, um, I'm from Jamaica, the same thing happens in Jamaica. Gang warfare takes place along political lines. People have um, going to war or have conflict with each other over money, greed, financial gain. Territory is another issue right now, Belize and Guatemala. We have a, a dispute over the borders. There are disputes and conflicts over religious beliefs. And of course, there's also gender-based hostilities that exist in our societies today. What Bob Marley is describing through poetry and song is the fallen, sinful condition of the world that I described last week. And he's saying, and he's singing, his song is saying, that until these things are fixed, there will always be conflict. There will always be hostility. There will always be war. Bob Marley says that until that day, the dream of lasting peace, world citizenship, rule of international morality will remain but a, few, a fleeting illusion to be pursued but never attained. Everywhere is war. In writing those last words, what Bob Marley failed to understand is that the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of the good news of God, has already brought a solution to address these issues. And this is what our, this basketballer was saying. This basketballer was saying that if we don't address the underlying issue or the underlying reason for being hostile to each other, if those issues are not addressed and they can only be addressed through the gospel, then kneeling during the anthem to show your support of black lives is futile. The question then is, how does the gospel of Jesus Christ, the gospel of God, the gospel of the grace of God, solve these issues? As I said earlier in my message, understanding the nature of the gospel 
will help us see the power the gospel has to resolve these issues. So the first thing that I want to look at this morning about the gospel is that because the message of the gospel reduces all mankind to one state before God, yeah, that's what the gospel does. It reduces all of us to one state. We are all sinners under God's judgment. If you believe the gospel, it means then that you must lay down all prejudices. Having a prejudice against someone else has no place in the gospel because there's no reason, there's no valid reason for one human being to consider themselves better than another because all of us before God are sinners and all of us deserve his punishment. Say no matter who you are, you could be black or white, Asian, Mexican, Italian, German, Mestizo, Garifuna, Mayan, Amish, Creole, Arab, male, female, rich, poor. It doesn't matter who you are. The Lord looks at all mankind as sinners under his judgment. So the first thing I want you to understand that the gospel does is that it allows us to view humanity through the correct lens. Through the lens of almighty God. Of course, that's not what we experience on a day-to-day -day basis. You know, there's racial inequality. So many times, persons of different races look down on others of different races. I have a friend, he's black, and he's um, going out with an Asian girl, and her family don't like him. Well, I think they're, they're growing to like him. But those are issues when persons of different races intermarry. There are prejudices that exist in um, social, you know, in, this, in different social brackets. Rich people tend to, I'm not going to say all rich people, but sometimes you have rich people who look down on persons who are poorer than them. But this has no place if you believe the gospel. And I want to give an example from scripture. One of the most prejudiced groups of persons in the world were the Jews. God had revealed himself to Abraham and Abraham's children. And Abraham had Isaac and Isaac had Jacob. Jacob had his 12 sons and they became the nation of Israel. But over time, they had taken pride in this in this position not realizing that God revealed himself to them so that they may reveal the goodness of God to the world and so this is something that Peter had to learn in Acts we are told that God gave Peter a vision Peter saw a large sheet being lowered from heaven and in this sheet were many types of animals and God told Peter to eat up, eat all the animals. And Peter said, no, Lord, I can't eat anything that is unclean. And the Lord told Peter not to call anything that he made unclean. Peter didn't realize that be just before this, God had given Cornelius a message to go and call Peter. So Cornelius sent some men and they, they went for Peter and Peter went to Cornelius' house. And Cornelius explained to Peter, you know, I had this vision and uh, God told me to call you. No, I want to read for you what Peter says when he first enters into Cornelius' house. Cornelius is a Gentile, he's not a Jew. Listen to what Peter says in Acts chapter 10, verse 28. You yourselves know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call anyone uncommon or unclean. So when I was sent for, I came without objection. I ask you then, why have you sent for me? And Cornelius tells him why, and Peter 
preaches the gospel and they are saved. Now, the, the church in Jerusalem hears about this and Peter goes to them and explains to them what happened. And listen to Peter's explanation. He says that when I began to speak, in other words, when he was preaching to, the, to Cornelius and these other Gentiles, when I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came down on them just as on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will baptize with the Holy Spirit. It is clear that God gave those Gentiles the same gift he gave us when we believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. Who was I then to try and stop God? When they heard this, they stopped their criticism and praised God saying, Then God has given to the Gentiles also the opportunity to repent and believe. Here the Jews had to understand that the gospel message was going forth and this gospel was meant for all people. They had to lay down. They had to remove all their prejudices. And so the gospel by its very nature removes our prejudices. Secondly, the gospel by its very nature shows God's love his grace, his mercy, and kindness to all people. People who truly understand and believe the gospel message have a sincere heart for all sinful mankind. Christians get a bad name, and sometimes rightly so, because when it comes to the sinful acts of men, many times, we are quick to condemn, we are quick to judge, we are quick to ridicule others, and that ought not to be. Just yesterday, I saw this meme that I'm going to show right now. It says, when Christians want to help people, they simply pray. When they wish to persecute people, they get off their, and I deleted that word, their rear end, and actually do something. It's sad, but this is how we are often perceived. As Christians, we are known to be intolerant of sin, having a tendency to judge and scorn and ridicule sinners. When we behave this way, we show that we either do not understand the gospel or we have forgotten that we too are sinners in need of God's grace and mercy. On the other hand, I know many times persons take advantage of the goodness and the grace of the church. They have no intentions of repenting and turning to Christ, but them wah, 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 wah. And so, yes, you know, the, the two sides, we, we have some issues. But as believers, when we look at mankind, we should see people who are in need of the gospel message. You know, many times I look at our sporting stars and I say, man, what is the point, you know, being so rich and famous and all of that and lose your soul? My heart goes out to them and I say, man, they need to hear the gospel. Look at our po politicians. It, it, we're coming up to election time. They have a hunger and thirst for power. And many of, some of them, and I, I don't know, some of them, you know, they're looking to, to gain the seat, to advance themselves. They want to get rich. And oftentimes, my heart goes out to them because they too need to hear the gospel. You see various organizations who fight diligently for human rights, for children's rights and women's rights. And they, they do very good work helping people. And I, I look at these situations and in my heart I say, the real solutions to these problems is the gospel. And so as believers in Christ, people who believe that the scriptures are true, we must show the love and grace of God to all sinful mankind in practical ways. We must be known as people 
who love others and have a genuine care, a genuine desire for the well-being of all men. And not just saying it, but doing it. This is the example set for us by Jesus in Luke chapter 5, 29. He goes to Levi, the tax collector, and Levi, we read, made a great feast in his house. And there was a large company of tax collectors and others reclining at the table with them. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled at his disciples, saying, Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. The gospel by its very nature, removes all human prejudices. The gospel, by its very nature, shows God's love, grace, mercy, and kindness to all people. Then finally, the gospel, by its very nature, transforms sinful man into a new people for God. Creates a new people for God. Listen, to what happens to us when we put our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. We are told from the scriptures that we receive the Holy Spirit. We are made holy and clean. We are set free from the bondage of sin. We have eternal life and no longer death. We become God's children and we are no longer his enemies. He's always with us. We will never be separated from him. We have a great inheritance. And we are no longer guilty. But we are declared righteous. Imagine that. We move from being a sinner to being holy. From a slave to sin to being free from sin. From death to life. From enemies of God to sons and daughters of God. From being separated from God to be reconciled and always with him. From being under his anger and wrath to experiencing his peace and rest. From being guilty and condemned to be declared righteous and justified. As a Christian, we therefore have a new identity. So if you're a father or your mother or your friend or your boyfriend, call your names, them say, man, you're ugly, you're good for nothing or something like that. As a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ, you can say, I don't care what you say, the Lord loves me and he has died for me and he has made me new. My identity, my worth comes not from what you think or what you say. It comes from the maker of heaven and earth. What he says about me. And the scriptures say, he loves me. So this, this changes us. This transforms our mind. It transforms our thinking. So not only are we loving and kind to the world, but in God... Christ has created for himself a new people. So within the body of Christ, there is no longer an emphasis on our physical differences. It doesn't matter because we have become one in Christ. And this is what Galatians tells us. Galatians 3, 26 says, For in Christ Jesus, you are all sons of God through faith. For as many of you were baptized into Christ, have put on Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is no male and female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you are Christ's, then you are Abraham's offspring and heirs according to his promise. 
Revelation tells us something similar. Revelation 5, 9. As they worship the Lord Jesus Christ and they sang a new song saying, Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals. For you, are, you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe, from every language, from every people, from every nation. And you have made them a kingdom and priests to our God. And they shall reign on the earth. Finally, Ephesians 2 verse 11 says, Therefore remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh were at that time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise having no hope and without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. For through him, Jesus, we both, that's the Jew and Gentile, both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then... You are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. You know what is absolutely shocking to me? When you listen to persons who say they understand and believe the gospel, but at the same time, they hate, they slander, they condemn, they ridicule other believers. Yes, conflicts will take place within the body of Christ. I was just telling a young man the other day that, you know, we are all sinners. We make mistakes. We are being um, sanctified and being made into the image of Christ from now until we die. So conflicts will take place. But conflicts within the body of Christ is an opportunity for the Holy Spirit to work and empower you to learn how to love each other, how to get along with each other. And so, I've been reading on Wednesdays on our Zoom meetings, Ephesians 4, which says, be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. The Ephesians says, make every effort to keep the unity of the spirit through the bond of peace. There is one body, one spirit, just as you were called to the one hope that belongs to your call. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you along with all malice. Be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Can you imagine if we all lived like this? Think about that. Can you imagine living in your family in this type of, with this kind of peace? Or what about your community? Can you imagine PUP and UDP persons, you know, supporters, loving one another like this, being tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave all of them? The gang warfare. Can you imagine one day you wake up, one, you know, one night you wake up, them shooting after each other. The next night you wake up and they're loving each other. They say, brother, I love you. I forgive you. Just like how God 
in Christ forgave me. This, my friends, is the solution to the social issues we face in the world today. The good news of Jesus Christ. So we fail, really. We fail as followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. We fail to show God's love to the world who desperately needs it. And we fail many times to show the love of God to our fellow brothers and sisters in Christ. And so many times it makes me wonder if those who say they are Christians really and truly understand and believe the gospel. And so the gospel, by its very nature, removes all human prejudices. The gospel, by its very nature, shows God's love, grace, mercy, and kindness to all people. The gospel creates out of sinful mankind one new people for God. Therefore, the gospel has the power to break down human divides. It breaks down the hostilities that exist between mankind. The gospel has the power to pierce the cold heart of man with the love and the kindness of God. The gospel has the power to transform sinners into a new creation. This morning as I close, I just want to encourage us all primarily those of us who are believers to recognize what we have in our grasp we have the good news of Jesus Christ it has the power to transform the hearts and lives of mankind we have the power to transform our nation Belize our communities our homes by telling others about the good news of Jesus Christ. May the Lord, by the power of his Holy Spirit, give us the strength, give us the boldness to proclaim his good news for his namesake. Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly through the righteousness of our God and Savior Jesus Christ who have been given a faith as precious as ours may grace and peace be yours in full measure through Jesus Christ our Lord <laughs>